Hi guys, sorry I was muted. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, Roland and M. It's quite an ominous name, but thank you for also joining us. Uh, before we start, it was very interesting to hear from Adaposi that uh, the colloquial saying of now now was also a Nigerian saying, and that uh, African time does truly um, supersede borders. And uh, we're very happy that you guys have joined us today for quite an important topic um, or thematic that uh, we obviously can't dive into completely, but uh, aimed, is aimed at directing this discussion, which is a very open discussion. It's also one of the first discussions that as the now now we have been involved in of this format. So for us, very exciting. Um, thank you to Open Arms Lagos for inviting us for this discussion. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction and then I'd like to ask as an icebreaker each of the Open House Lagos and Sahara Center, sorry, Louise, who's joining us, um, and Nana team members to do a short introduction of themselves before we get into the discussion. And then we'll go through a few questions um, related to the topic, related to Open House Lagos and how they see themselves positioning themselves around the topic and how the, the Nana team aim to address or work around or think about this topic of identity and decolonization in Africa. Um, and then we will end with a few open questions and hopefully it becomes a free for, free flowing format where people chime in and, and basically contribute to whatever points we make. Um, so just to kick it off, uh, the title is obviously Redefining African Architecture, the conversation between Open House Lagos and the Nana competition on identity and decolonization through in and about architecture. Um, in today's world, the importance of architecture in shaping identity is widely recognized, uh, more so than it would have arguably been recognized in the past. However, when it comes to African architecture, there's a need for critical reevaluation. The influence of co colonial and imperialist legacies has deeply impacted architectural practices across the continent. External perspectives, or often Eurocentric perspectives, have often dominated the narrative, as seen in the works of Domchowski and Labelle Prusen, who extensively studied the indigenous, indigenous African architecture and portrayed it through sketches as something foreign or something that we aren't necessarily, that does not necessarily fall within the canon of architecture. And in UCT or CPUT or, or other universities throughout Africa, this topic is very prevalent in us at present trying to understand how to unravel these ways of teaching and this education that has surrounded us. So, at the moment, there's definitely the question is being raised of why African architects have been slow to challenge Western standards in education and pre professional practice, and which obviously relates to the venture built works. And while global economic factors and client demands play a role, African architects have a unique opportunity to redefine beauty and question these prevailing norms. The vibrant African entertainment and music scenes have already successfully forged their own paths. I find this point extremely interesting as a precedent for the discussion. Um, but architecture seems to be hesitating and seems to be a bit slower afoot uh, concerning this overall debate. So this event aims to explore the initiatives taken by Africans who are striving to reshape the narrative and establish a distinct African architectural identity. From an architectural festival in Lagos, uh, which we will hear mo more about, to a new platform, a brand new platform in Cape Town, uh, we have gathered this group of individuals to, uh, to discuss these important topics. So. Yeah, just to kick things off as an icebreaker, um, I'd like, uh, so Eloise, uh, our very special replacement today, a highly skilled architect and center manager for the Sahara Center with a master's in environmental design. Um, uh, and also you have contributed to numerous projects demonstrating your expertise and passion for the profession. Uh, I, I would like to ask you the question of what you love and what you hate about your city in short. A uh, little urban rant that we can use to kick off the conversation. Okay, uh, thank you for introducing me. Um, hello everyone, welcome. Okay, so uh, what I love about my city, I love that it is um, it's, it's very familiar in a sense that um, people are very much open with you. Uh, you can see somebody on the streets and uh, they can just engage you in conversation. There are people engaging in conversations everywhere in Lagos. People are talking. 
you know, it's a very vibrant city as well. There is a vibrant nightlife and also like day life. Everything is just like very fast paced. So I really enjoy that about the city. Um, what I dislike, uh, I would say is very much the urban mobility and the way people um, are kind of not cared for in as much as they care for each other. The city doesn't seem to be cared, like doesn't seem to care for them in a way. So very much the, the people, like I took a picture just last week and in that picture, you would see that the sidewalks, there are buses on the, on the sidewalk and then the people are walking on the road. So I'm like, what does this say about us? What does this say about us as, as, as like, as we care for ourselves, right? So we have morphed into this identity of oh, prioritizing cars and prioritize, prioritizing roads in our cities, but we've not been able to understand that we actually need um, walkable uh, cities, cities that kind of care for our own well-being. So that's my opening statement. Great, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Adeposi, uh, Adeposi is an urban activist, a researcher and a designer specializing in just inclusive urban development. Adeposi combines design expertise of research to drive positive change in urban communities across Africa. And Adeposi, you are obviously our, the main man in inviting us to this conversation. Thank you very much. If you don't mind quickly adding on to the introduction and giving us a, a little snip of what you love and what you hate about Lagos. Yeah, I just hate the traffic. Traffic is bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, waste time, waste money. Um, and I love, I love the energy of Lagos. Honestly, uh, you can't come to this city and be dull. You know, it, it's very vibrant. It's very energizing. Uh, you, you have to be smart. You're forced to be smart, and you, you. I think if you survive in Lagos, you can survive anywhere in the world. I know that's a corny statement, but. <laughs> It's true, honestly. Um, you if you are making Lagos, you can get it back. So, yeah. Mm. Great. Even Johannesburg. Yeah, even Johannesburg. <laughs> <laughs> Elohim. Um, Elohim, our, I think our youngest member in today's call is an architecture student. That's. I'm hoping so. You don't think so? Okay, no. I'm, no. Hope, I'm, hoping, hoping, so. I'm <laughs> hoping I am, because <laughs> I'm here to speak on behalf of the youth voices. So. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Elohim is an architecture student at CPUT or Cape Peninsula University of Technology. He is a committee member at Young Urbanists, um, a local advocacy group uh, in, in and around Cape Town, and an architectural intern at Bitrock, uh, my previous employer as well. He is exper experienced in events planning and art direction with youth and community based organizations, and definitely, I would say, a pro at communication. So, Elohim, if you don't mind taking it away. <laughs> Hi everyone. So yeah, as Sebastian mentioned, um, I'm not from Cape Town. I'm from Angola. So I'll focus on yeah. I'll speak on what I love and what I hate about my country, my hometown. So and I find it interesting that the things that I love the most can relate to what Eloise and yeah and other people just shared. So uh, but I'll so I'll face I'll focus first on the on the things that I hate is the lack of infrastructure which uh, for, so which can be like problems in mobility, uh, then electricity, water. We saw now like it would relate as well to, to South Africa in terms of load shedding, but you guys at least have a warning. You have an app where you can track it. <laughs> so yeah, this would be, this would be the, yeah, the things that I hate the most. And the things that I love would be place making that we do not depend or the people itself does not depend on spaces to be created for them to make use of them but they actually just take ownership okay they may not take the best care of them of certain spaces but we we just make things work and yeah and it's the people that make the city not the not the opposite yeah so this is i think this is one thing that we have in common 
Yeah, so it's more like tactical urbanism. Yeah, more like, oh, <laughs> or even guerrilla uh, urbanism. People are just taking yeah ownership of these spaces. Mm. Yeah, and that's the case in my hometown. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ibrahim. So moving from yes. Nigeria um, to Angola, all the way down to Cape Town, or South Africa, should I say. Um, now I'd like to introduce Mayank. Uh, Mayank is an architect, entrepreneur, and educator with diverse experiences in architectural projects and larger, sc larger scale firms. He has gained recognition for his achievements in publishing works. His interests span design, project management, and entrepreneurship. Uh, Mayank, what do you love and what do you hate about Cape Town? Well, hi guys. Um, yeah, I think Cape Town is a it's an interesting city, not only because we have no power right now, and my phone is doing amazing things for us, but it's a great city for drama in the sense that it's a good collision between the natural landscape and quite a thriving um, urban scape. And I think because of that, it's one of the most uh, striking places for me that I've seen in the world. Um, I'm Cape Town born and bred. And I think one of the things in Cape Town that I don't really just I don't like that much is that the fact that you know in terms of mobility and and other constraints that's happened through its formation is left it a bit um, standstill. Um, and I think Cape Town in that sense has a lot of potential in the mm. future. Cool. And jump across to your your partner on your left, uh, Ishmael. Ishmael is a master's architecture graduate from the University of Cape Town as well and currently works as a candidate architect at uh, the firm DHK, also based in Cape Town. His academic focus is on resilience amidst political and social adversity. Uh, hopefully we can hear a bit more about that in our conversation, particularly in spatial justice. He was also chosen by the Norman Foster Foundation for the Affordable Housing Workshop of 2022. Ishmael, do you mind letting us know what you love and hate about Cape Town? Hi guys, thank you so much um, for that introduction, Seb. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think what I love and what I hate about the city is one in the same. It's the social aspect of it. Um, there's so many different cultures and religions and um, ideologies that exist in the city um, that is beautiful when it coexists harmoniously, but at the same time when it doesn't, there's a lot of conflict and tension between uh, cultures and ideas. So yeah. Um, keeping it short and sweet. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, guys, for the introduction. And um, yeah, I think with those small topics, it would be good to jump into the conversation. Uh, we are obviously speaking between um, a, a basically a large scale festival that's Open House Lagos. And Adaposi, I will now ask you to introduce Open House Lagos. And um, when you do, could you please tell us why conversations such as this is important? what you would like to discover out of such a conversation and any sort of interesting thoughts you have regarding the fact that you're based in Lagos, most of us are based in, in Cape Town and how you think such a discourse could contribute towards ideas of identity in African architecture and the eventual decolonization of African architecture. Thank That's you. That's a packed question there. Sebastian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, Open House Lagos, is an architecture festival. Uh, so that means we celebrate architecture in our city. And we've been running for eight years now. Um, we were the first of its kind in Africa uh, because the concept of open house cities uh, was started by the Open House London, and which later became Open House Worldwide, and they set up first in Lagos. And it was a very interesting experience, you know, the first maiden edition of this, this activity, um, because many people live in the city, but they do not experience the city. And so this was a very new experience for them. You know, you drive from your home to work, you go by buildings, you see architecture, but you never really interact with it. You don't experience it. And Open House was this opportunity for people to actually go into these spaces to touch it, feel it. You know to live in it um so that was a very strong point for us and since then we've been exploring various themes um within the city from the aquatic nature of the city because it's uh it's uh the coastal city 
um, to issues around reclamation, because this is this is what's happening in the city. And this year we're focusing on contemporary uh, on contemporary Lagos. So how are designers today um, designing for the city? Um, <clears throat> And and you're going to see this in, in the presentation I'll be making later, but um, you know why is this conversation important for our, for us? Why is it important for our team? Is because we are you know our age, our time now. We're building the cities of the future. We're building the cities that will be the hotspots of uh, the urban, the global urban scene in the next. 10, 20 years. Um, and it's very important to consider what are the influences for these kind of cities, for these cities and the future. So um, uh, if, 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 we, if we are not careful, we're going to be creating cities that are mirrors of uh, other cities, that are mere duplicates, that are mere imitations. And we don't want to live in imitation cities. We want to live in authentic cities, cities with culture, with, with life. And, and I think this is why it's important for us to consider this discourse around uh, competitions, because um, a lot of the city has been built around this idea of competitions. And whoever wins these competitions tend to be the ones to have a say about how the city is formed. Um, uh, so yeah. We're going to see, you know, during this conversation, you know, who has had the say, who has not had the say, and you know, what should the say be, so to speak. You know, how should our our architecture look like? How should it function? How should it um, how should it exist in in the African context? So yeah, that's the my brief response to your question, which I believe I will answer further in the present. Great, thank you, Anaposi. Uh, and you you quickly remind me of a post that Open House Lagos made, I think uh, it says here yeah, 68 weeks ago. Uh, but uh, it's an amazing render of the future of Lagos by the American firm SOM or Skid, Skidmore Owings Merrill, uh, where they've managed to win an urban regeneration proposal for the middle of Lagos. Uh, one could argue that 95 to 99% of their firm has never visited your city. And I think that's really the, the topic that we're trying to touch on with uh, Elohim telling us about how the life of Angola um, inspires him and Eloise, how the like hustle and bustle of the city uh, drives you. Um, we truly can't have firms from America winning such proposals and designing our future cities. Um, so with that, I'd like to jump over to Elohim. Um, Elohim, could you please in briefly introduce us to the Now Now competition. Uh, what is the intention behind it, with it being the first one and just launched? What is that I, like main idea of this platform, and what do you wish personally for this platform to become? Okay, good. So in first place, I think what we, as the core team of Now Now, have agreed on, like both intentionally and just spontaneously, has been around boldness. And this will take me back to my previous comment would be, would, that was about taking ownership of things. So, and you mentioned that uh, or the, the point of this conversation is talking about identity. And this comes down to the individual, not to the, not to the, to the, before it's the responsibility of a community, of a group. So the now now aims to establish that, to inspire that for people to be, for designers, for architects to be more bold, to dig, to find a little bit more about themselves and as well to communicate something through their designs that can actually reflect the reality of the people that, that, design, that they're designing for. And at the same time, showcase that, that talent, that role talent that is out there, promote it, give, create a platform for for people to grow as well for people to to learn and to and to show as well what they what they're capable of so yeah in simple terms that would be it to inspire to provoke sing mm -hmm. then uh, comes the sense of urgency on the now now it needs to be done <laughs> it needs to be brought out it needs to be given life so yeah that would be now now personally yeah great 
Thank you, Elihim. I'll take a very short innuendo and just say thank you to Sarah and Roland for joining us. They will be juries of the first competition. Very exciting and we, we're very happy to have them on the initial panel. It will also be an exploration of how this all works and we hope we don't uh, irritate you with too much work or bad admin. Um, uh, now I would like to jump over to Mayank and I'd like to ask the question of uh, it's obviously a tough thing to grapple with when you state that you'd like to be a continental competition and it's it's a bit bold, it can seem naive, uh, it can come across as a lot of things. Um, you personally, what sort of um, hope do you have for the Nana competition regarding the African continent and how do you see the platform allowing for competitions that go beyond uh, what is now just a competition being hosted at the tip of Africa in Cape Town? Um, yeah, if you don't mind answering that question. Thanks, Seb. Um, yeah, firstly, I think it's it's this question doesn't really exist without acknowledging um, it's 2023, and I think global. You have to think globally in that sense. So, regardless of the fact that we're at the bottom of the continent, I think it's I see this platform as one that not only um, has a core team and has very strong and unique partners, but one that also uh, forms fantastic networks across various countries and stuff. And, you know, this is a first of, um, of a connection between South Africa and, 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 and or Cape Town and, and Lagos. But in that sense, like how the competition can can function is, you know, not only virtually, not only online, but it functions as a as a platform to not, to empower, give designers, architects, uh, urbanists a, a voice to that they previously might not have had. But it gives us that sense of taking ideas and making them larger, and also encouraging discussions that are topical and um, relevant to the time that we live in. Because, as we all know, these are some crazy times um yeah it's fantastic i think to to engage with people not only across our continent as we're doing right now but uh hopefully in the future across the world um about something that i think we all hold very close to us thanks yeah great great thanks um and yeah i think building on that uh, as part of the team nano we would love to eventually uh develop a brief in a, in a different African country, uh, and Lagos, I think would be a fascinating location. But with local partners who do understand the context and can give us an eye into what's topical and what is the what is being designed around and what's being thought of in different urban contexts. Um, now, I would like to uh, move on to our next question, and uh, the question is going to be first. Um, it's a little bit of a trickier question, and it'll be posed to Eloise. Uh, Eloise, if you also don't mind introducing what the Sahara Center does uh, in Lagos. I am, I'm guessing you guys are based in Lagos. Um, but beyond, beyond Open House Lagos, the Sahara Center, and the Nano competition, today's theme is about how different advocacies, events, or groups discuss decolonization and identity or an African identity or local identities through architecture. Um, and I would like to ask the question, how does the Sahara Center imagine itself engaging with local architects, designers, creatives to foster this discourse and a sense of ownership and pride in your architecture or design? All right, um, thank you for the question. So what the Sahara Center does um, basically is to empower the creative industries as change agents and developing a more socially cohesive Nigeria. So what that means is that we're working across the board. We're not just focused on one industry or the other. We're making sure that we're encouraging dialogue. We're making sure that we're encouraging conversation across the board. And we're also, we do this through initiatives like um, our immersive workshops. One of them is coming up very soon. It's called Lantern Labs. It's a critical thinking workshop for societal, uh, to encourage societal change. We also did this through our advocacy and research. Last year, we, um, during the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, we raised some money across uh, about 40 uh, creative industries 
for them to start practically making progress within their communities. And then through our, um, our research, because that's the core of what we do, we, are, we did a uh, research in Lagos Islands to understand the, the recreation and tourism around how they view themselves, how the residents view uh, recreation and tourism around Lagos Island. So we're not trying to, we're trying to encourage collaboration, we're trying to encourage that open dialogue, and we're trying to really make people start um, getting involved and understanding what our role is as creative industries. How do we make a change? These are the things that we do. Amazing. I think the fact that you encourage participation, uh, and collaboration, and um, yeah, just getting people involved and showing them that they can create something is, is, is quite similar to a competition. And I think now I'd like to shift that conversation over to Ishmael and say, um, if someone from the Nana or Ishmael, you could give your opinion on what the key elements are that allow for architecture competition to design for architectural identity, whether it's setting in up the brief or how you pose a brief, et cetera. What sort of, yeah, what sort of briefs uh, do you think the Nana team should create to encourage us to address topics of decolonization and identity um, in Africa? Uh, thanks, Deb. Uh, so I think that um, with the, um, with the type of competition that the now now is trying to come up with is it goes back to what my uncle was saying earlier it's topical it's things that are relevant in today's time um, that we see there are there are real solutions for um, and i think that this goes hand in hand with when when you when you propose a competition you invite people, you invite students, you invite professionals to share their thoughts on these topics. And I think something that's really, really unique to a competition is that it sort of levels the playing field. It allows people to express their voice, their opinions, their thoughts and ideas, and manifest it into a speculative proposal um, that could potentially be realized. Great, thanks. Thanks. Um, I see that we're halfway through our call, and I think as a general introduction to different advocacy groups and the idea of the competition, it's been quite a nice start. Um, and now I think as, as most of the Nana teams LOM are originally from South Africa, it would be great to learn a little bit more about Lagos. And um, I'd like to open up the floor to Adeposi. And my question uh, I, I posed in a very short presentation is, are there notable examples of competition architecture in Lagos or, or renowned architectural competitions being hosted that we don't know about, um, being from South Africa? And could you also show us a few contemporary examples um, that successfully incorporate, in your opinion, um, local or African design principles uh, that showcase uh, Nigerian architecture? Um, and basically, architecture that you love, architecture that you need, does your cultural context and people's service. And, uh, yeah, basically show off a bit uh, to us about Lagos. All right, so all right, so let's do a bit of show don't tell. Um, I shall share my screen now. Um, and uh, we will use this presentation to respond to that very big question that uh, Sebastian just asked. <laughs> So as, as I mentioned before, Open House Lagos, we do a lot of things. We do curated tours. So we have a weekend um, where, um, you know, we visit about 30 buildings with buses and these buses have themes. So we can visit like the luxurious buildings in the city or we can visit buildings that are green and eco-friendly. Eco or we can visit buildings that are ancient and have sort of a historical heritage attached to them. We have talk symposia, like you can see here, we have tour guide training. We have um, panel discussions like you are we're in right now. So this was uh, previous one we had last year. Um, this we have exhibitions, art exhibitions. We have cultural preservation. We have architectural education, which is very important, you know, to this conversation about um, competitions. 
and we try to have fun <laughs> as much as possible. So this year, as I said, also we are considering uh, Lagos Contemporary, and we are exploring contemporary design in Lagos through five themes. Uh, this month, we've considered the theme of materiality, and we have considered smartness. And now we're going to be considering the African city or identity in, in the African city. And that's why we're having this conversation with um, Now Now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a series of pictures with you. Um, and I was hoping, okay, we don't have to make it interactive. You can talk about it later. So these pictures that you see, um, they are landmark buildings and some very interesting designs that have been proposed. And one thing that is common across these pictures is that these were products of design competition. Um, so we have the National Theater, we have the Transcorp Hilton, we have this convention center in uh, the Southeast part of Nigeria. And we have these beautiful looking master plans, <laughs> a very glassy um, master plans. So this one is um, Alaro City. I think um, Sebastian made mention to it. This one is uh, the Centenary City in Abuja. And this one is uh, uh, something that was done for uh, Ibadan. Um, so these were competitions, but there's also another thread running through these things is that the winners of these competitions were not Nigerian. So this one was done by I think Bulgarian architect, SOM, American architect, um, European architect here, uh, Dar Al and the size. Uh, Dar is a Middle Eastern firm. So but these are buildings that we cherish, and these are spaces that we look up to. Many of uh, people who aspire to it, they want to have this in their city. You know, this National Theater, for example, is hailed as the icon of, of Nigerian architecture. Um, so why is it that, you know, these non-Nigerians are, you know, creating the cities that we live in? Now, there's nothing wrong with that, as you will see in the next, um, the next slide. So these are also designs and buildings by Nigeria. Um, but another interesting thing in this comparison picture is that these Nigerians are not, you know, are necessarily black people like me. <laughs> you know, this is the the um, the Faculty of Science um, by uh, Professor John Godwin. Uh, this is James Cubitt, architect. So why am I comparing and contrasting these uh, pictures? Because I'm not here to give you an answer as to what makes architecture Nigerian architecture, what makes something African architecture. I'm only here to raise this question in your mind. Right? So what makes this, this series of images, Funle Adeyemi, um, Bagan, Benjamin, you know, what makes these designs and buildings, you know, different from these ones? Um, I don't have the answer, but I have an attempt at the answer, right? And I'm going to give you my own perspective. So um, a design competition that was done in, in, in uh, 2021, I believe, by the Eddie Eguavon Foundation, was about uh, this Lagos as a water city. And I'm just going to share uh, my design entry for this competition. And perhaps you would see, you might start to see what it is that makes this a uh, truly Nigerian project or truly African project, if you will. Um, so this is uh, Otumara. You know, Otumara is a small fishing community uh, the number of fishing communities across Lagos, as you can see. Um, and there's a huge problem with fishing in, in, in the city because Niger with Lagos or Nigeria, even as a country, buys its own fish, which is a weird situation because Chinese trawlers and Dutch trawlers, 
you know, just go around the coast here and they collect this fish and they sell to Nigeria. And the Navy can't really do much about it. And so fishing as a practice, you know, as, an, as a vocation amongst these fishing communities has been threatened. And that's the same thing that happened to Otumara, where, you know, people just packed up their books. Um, so went to the community, we found out uh, the infrastructure, the level of uh, knowledge that was available. Um, and we proposed this fishing hub. You know, we started off with this small proposal, which would test out the idea of a fishing market. And this you know, small fishing hub could then grow into a larger fish market, a small wharf and a larger wharf. Um, so this was a, a proposal. You know, another interesting thing about this proposal was that we acknowledge that, you know, government is not going to solve this issue of flooding. Government is not going to build infrastructure to prevent flooding or manage it. They're not going to build waste management systems. So we have to think about how we can accommodate the flooding. So when it comes, how do you accommodate? And this is not the way government tends to think when it comes to planning. You know, we have, they tend to have this utopian that things are going to be all right but we tried not to pretend that things are going to be all right because flooding is going to come. So hence we raised these structure. Uh, these were the fishing, um, the market stalls, very porous, um, and some of the infrastructure that we proposed. Another interesting thing is this uh, fishing rig that we also proposed because we noticed that just a little bit off Otumara in the Okobaba and the uh, uh, Makoko axis, people have these rafts, you know, that they push with sticks. And on these rafts, they, they, you know, they trade, they store fish, they go out into the lagoon and they stay there for a long while. So we started to say, okay, how can we conceptualize this and bring it into a design? So we proposed this raft that could be attached to one another that could create larger, you know, connections. Um, so at the end of when we're having this conversation, you tell me if this is uh, Nigerian, what makes it Nigerian? Why, if it is not Nigerian, why is it not Nigerian? Um, and this is, uh, this is the, this is uh, my own response to what makes something Nigerian architecture. And this is something that was produced from a design competition uh, that was done by the Eddie Egbavon Foundation. So thank you very much, uh, Sebastian, for the opportunity to share this uh, brief presentation. Uh, and thank I you. hope it can influence our conversations moving forward. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, and I do believe that like what you pointed out here is something that, uh, that our jury will, uh, I think it's something that our jury holds very dear when it comes to judging our participants' applications. Uh, it's not going to be about shiny, flashy renders or what looks the most perfect, but what is truly the most uh, appropriate, if I could use that word. Um, thanks. And I, I think that's a nice way to also introduce a segue over to our last question before we open up the discussion for the panel, where we can probably take three or four questions as we are running low on time. Um, but I'll be asking the last question to Elohim. Um, after this introduction, Elohim, can you maybe discuss the historical context of artificial competitions in Africa and um, in relation to it, the much developed architectural competition ecosystem of Europe. Could you help us in understanding the impacts of these competitions in shaping our built environments? And what role do you believe competitions can play um, in advancing African architectural practices and in discussing our diverse identities in a post-colonial future for the continent? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a question. Eh? <laughs> Oh, so but I think there's there's okay. Perhaps focus on three points that are worth mentioning, so it doesn't expand too much. But looking into the historical context of comp architectural competitions, like if we had to compare for just for the sake of this discussion of how Europe and uh, let's say the global north has been advanced and been doing it for quite a long time compared to what we have been doing in Africa in terms of architectural competitions, it, it's a it's a big difference. We can see like if the, even the we have reference like even the Eiffel Tower and Sydney Opera House and 
many of the iconic buildings that are out there were results of competitions. And by that time, what we were busy doing in Africa was something completely different. But uh, it doesn't mean that we don't have time and opportunity and talent enough to catch up. And the other thing would be the scale and complexity of those competitions. While many problems that we deal with, that we're facing in Africa at the moment to solve, to solve infrastructure and many other, like social housing and other things, have been sorted out a long time ago in the global north, comparing again for, yeah. And what we, when we look at ourselves, then we see that the scale and complexity of our competitions, it's way different. We're not asking people to design uh, skyscrapers and shopping malls, but we asking them to design something that is actually meaningful for like can be a symbol, of course, symbol making uh, can be an iconic building, a pavilion, but as well as answering to an, a different, a different sort of question. So the scale and complexity, complexity of what is demanded or what, ex what is expected on those competitions is different uh, at a certain level, but we saw some examples as well of a certain complexity master plans that were results of competitions in 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 africa but we see who are the ones that partake on those competitions and as mm. well we have the cultural influence mm. so we cannot disregard that it's very different it doesn't matter how uh, many strategies and innovations we try to like to to apply or to implement from one background from one place to the other but it's it's different and that diversity is what makes us unique and that that brings us the 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 need or the urgency of having briefs for architectural competitions that are from and for the the for africa yeah so this is this is very special and there's lots of benefits we can yeah it's the design innovation we saw an example here with uh, what a deposit just showed us the public engagement as well gives people the opportunity to be a little bit a little bit more democratic if i could say on what is built on what is designed on what is our approach to architecture in our context is very specific we showcase the talent as well we allow people to be more bold as a student i can speak of from experience that what we get at campus or our, uh, our briefs it's not the same thing it doesn't give us the same creative freedom that we have in a competition like this with the, with the pavilion or something that we can do in collaboration with open house Lagos, a competition for for nigeria for to address other to address other issues but in a unique manner that only us can do because we know what we are dealing with and lastly the social impact as well because we know who are we designing for. And as I said in the beginning, in terms of identity and decolonization through architecture or in architecture, which are very different things, it starts with us. It's a personal question. Yeah, it's, it, it needs some introspection. It starts with the individual and then it expands to a group to a community, to a corporation. So we all need to interrogate ourselves. And when you find the answers through a competition, a team of three people, you can tailor that to answer the, the needs that you have. Yeah, mm. I hope this was enough to, yeah. But those are my views. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Ruim. And that's a great, I think, closing comment before we open it up for some questions. I hope there are a few questions from the, from the audience. Um, yeah, we have five minutes for questions from the audience. I'm not sure if anyone wants to ask a question right now, how that works. Can you raise your hand on Google Meet? I'm not even sure. Um, otherwise, just speak. Um, and then we will rejoin for until 7 o'clock from the same link, um, if that's possible. I see Adiposi, you're raising your hand. No, I just want to show you, you can raise your hand. There's ah, you can raise your hand. So, um, yeah, do we have any questions? Uh, otherwise, I'm going to force... Feel free to type in the chat. Also. Feel, feel free to? Yeah, type them in the comments. Um, I should know how to say all this after being on Zoom for two years. I don't know. Um, 
Lerato or Victoria, do you have any questions? Hi. Just comment in general. Oh, yes. well, Victoria? Hi. Oh, I'm for the head in. Um, kind of. I'm still trying to like formulate my question, but thank you um, for your insights. It's pretty interesting because I actually uh, work for Anefa um, Kunlea Dayami, and so we've been, you know, doing a lot of research in the last year on water cities. And obviously, we have a focus and a strong interest in Makuku um, and just the future development of Lagos. Um, but I think, yeah, the challenge is like competitions is one thing. Um, and but I think, you know, real progress has to be kind of incentivized by the government and the municipality. And so it's as architects, it's like how how much of a role do we have in really like I think talking to people and understanding kind of the landscape of um, yeah how architects and designers are thinking on the content on the continent is really inspiring. But it's just how do we take things to the next level to um, really make sure that um, yeah the governments can can really facilitate these developments and really support designers um, and urban planners on ground to really make the changes that we need, especially for things like mobility um, and yeah, real kind of urban infrastructures. Um, so yeah, I think that's always like, how do we <laughs> bridge and take the next step? That's, that's, mm. yeah. Mm. that's yeah. That's great. And I, I think the fact that you are speaking about the next step means that you believe in the idea of the competition as a starting step, which is quite quite positive. So Sebastian, quite I just want to add something yeah. that if the meet yeah. ends, you can just rejoin with the same link mm. uh, so that we have another goal. But we will just try to keep it within maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. So the, the meeting will end in one minute and then I'll be cut off awkwardly and then we can all rejoin. Um, and after that, I'll, I'll just put in the comments maybe an email address where if you would like to rather send your question um, to either Adapusi or myself, that would be amazing as we are grappling with these ideas and, and your opinions and thoughts would be 